air travel is exploding. Three million people, 30,000 planes, in the air every single day. With so many planes in the sky, it's no surprise that things don't always go according to plan. Flying is, is inherently risky. The aircraft's travelling at the speed of a pistol bullet. It's in a rarefied atmosphere. It's minus 56 degrees outside the aeroplane. But for pilots, the major worries don't begin until you get near the ground. There will be incidents, and most of those, over 50%, occur on landing. Tonight, we count down the world's 10 scariest plane landings caught on film. This is Los Angeles International Airport. The lives of the 146 people on board this flight from California to New York rest on this twisted piece of metal. The next few seconds determine whether the front landing gear will hold up on touchdown or snap in two and drive the nose of the plane into the runway. Local news are reporting live from the scene. A worldwide audience of millions holds its breath. Very serious situation. It all comes down these next few moments for those people who are on board this flight. It's 17 minutes past six in the evening. This plane took off nearly three hours ago from Burbank Airport, just 30 miles down the coast. It's been circling for hours, preparing for an emergency touchdown. Problems began just minutes after takeoff, when the pilot attempted to retract the plane's landing gear. He knew where the problem lay, but couldn't be sure exactly what was wrong. Passenger Dave Reinitz was on the flight, and he remembers the moment the pilot announced that they had a problem. So I'm sitting in there, and I'm kind of in that hazy traveler's sleep thing, and, and then there's some commotion about the cabin. The pilot comes on, and he says, uh, we have an indication that there may be some problems with the landing gear. As the 140 passengers on board begin to take in what's happening, Dave Reinitz picks up his video camera and starts to film. There was some tension in the plane. You could feel people getting a little bit nervous. And then a little while later, maybe five minutes later, he comes on again and he says, uh, so we are going to do a visual inspection uh, of the landing gear. So we're going to go down to Long Beach and we're going to fly low and slow so that they can see the landing gear to determine whether in fact there's a problem. And so now it's getting a little bit nervous. Now we're, now we're detoured, we're going in a different direction, we're going to another airport to look at it. So again, it gets a little bit more nervous. Long Beach Air Traffic Control confirmed that the plane's landing gear was stuck in the wrong position. An emergency landing was now inevitable. But things were about to take an even more surreal turn for the passengers of Flight 292. There were TVs on the plane, and all of a sudden, there's coverage of some plane in trouble on the TVs. So I'm watching the television, and there's a plane having a problem, and suddenly, you know, I'm thinking, wow, the poor folks on that plane. And then I realize, I'm, that's the, that's the plane we're on, that's us. Some people turn it right off, like they don't want to know. Uh, but I think, think most people are really focused on it, and then they're kind of comparing notes. What are you watching? What are they saying? What are they saying? What's, what's going on? Tension is rising in the cabin. Worse still, the 737's design means it's not able to dump fuel from its tanks, so the pilot is forced to keep flying in order to burn off enough to land safely. We realized it was going to be a couple of hours of flying around burning off fuel before the emergency landing. It's kind of like, hey, you're going to have a car accident, but hang out for a couple of hours. There are several reasons for burning off the fuel. He must reduce the amount of flammable aviation fuel on board in case of fire. And he needs to be at the right weight for landing. Land too hard, and he might snap the landing gear right away. But perhaps most importantly, he wants to keep his remaining fuel in the tanks located at the back of the aeroplane. The reason? 
to keep the weight at the rear so the pilot can keep the nose of the plane off the ground for as long as possible. As the moment of impact approaches, passenger Dave Reinitz records this extraordinary message. Hey Barb, it's me. I'm watching the plane on the TV. We're having the landing gear problems. We're going to crash land or emergency land, crash is a bad word, in LAX. And uh, they're telling us everything's going to be fine, and it is, but I just uh, thought I'd leave you a message just in case. It says, I love you. And everything is going to be groovy. Then, just after Dave recorded what he thought might be his very last words, the captain of flight 292 prepared his damaged plane for landing. As time rolls and we get closer and closer to the emergency landing, they start to prepare us. And, and it's a weird thing. We ha I have to decide which position I want to be in. So I've got a couple of choices. And the choice is either you can put your, your arms up high and lean against the front, or you can go down low and put your head between your knees. So all of a sudden, I have to decide what position would I like to be in a plane crash in? You know, what position do you want to die in? Coming up on world's scariest plane landings, things are getting hot in Manchester. High winds in Germany. And we prepare for landing with the passengers of Flight 292. The 146 passengers and crew on board this flight are desperate to land. They've been circling this airport for over two hours, but the plane's front landing gear is twisted the wrong way around. If it snaps on touchdown, the nose of the plane will smash into the ground at 100 miles an hour. Fatalities would be inevitable. One passenger, Dave Reinitz, is filming it all. The pilot prepares flight 292 for impact. The first three rows of seats have been emptied. All able-bodied persons have been positioned by the emergency exits to assist with evacuation. Then, the captain utters the words you never want to hear on a plane. Brace, brace, brace. It all comes down to this, uh, these next few moments for those people who are on board this JetBlue flight. There I am, I'm leaning up against the thing. You know, you can feel the plane coming down. You can feel it happening, you know? And we go down there and then all of a sudden over the speakers and in the cabin, you can hear the crew yelling, brace, brace, brace. Hundreds of firemen literally lined up along this runway. We've never seen a response like this, 10 feet above. And now you see those main landing gear touching down. But if the view from outside is shocking, it's even more terrifying for those people inside the plane. We get closer and closer, and then we hit the ground, and it's just shaking. It's just shaking, and, and, and then you can smell, I can smell the burning rubber from the tires just being ripped to pieces. We can smell all of that, and it's brace, brace, brace. It seemed to go on for a long time. Finally, it just stopped. And then it just settles down, and we realize that we're still in one piece, and then there's this big cheer. Right on! Woo! It's kind of like a first wave of surprise and then a wave of celebration. And then it was just, for me, it was just, get me off this plane. And I remember walking down the stairs and turning around and seeing the landing gear and seeing it completely sheared off halfway, like a perfect half circle, like you couldn't have measured it and cut it any better. That was a, a visually something I'll always remember. 
Incredibly, everyone on this flight walked away unharmed. There are six million working parts on a passenger plane. In this case, accident investigators found that a worn bolt contributed to the seizure of the plane's landing gear. But the reason for this next incident is much more fundamental. This Cessna 310 twin-engine aircraft is being ferried from the west coast of the United States to its new owner in Australia. It's being delivered by a 65-year-old professional plane courier from the UK. He took off from California and hopes to refuel in Hawaii, 2,400 miles away. Unfortunately, he only has enough fuel for 2,390 miles. That's 10 miles short. Luckily, the pilot realized that he was running out of fuel about 400 miles ago and radioed for help. This footage was filmed by the Hawaiian Coast Guard, who flew beside him in a C-130 Hercules helicopter, coaching him on how to land the tiny plane in the heavy Pacific swell. Under the circumstances, it's an amazing landing. And the sprightly OAP is out of the cockpit and in the arms of a rescue swimmer in seconds. The plane sank. The pilot escaped with minor injuries. How he explains it all to the plane's owner, we'll never know. It's 2006. This TNT cargo plane departed from Liège in Belgium en route to London Stansted Airport. It's already had one disastrous landing today. Now it's preparing for an emergency landing here at Birmingham International. The pilots have already made the mistake that will cost them their jobs. But their biggest challenge is yet to come. They have to land a crippled plane. This plane crashed into the ground at Nottingham East Midlands less than an hour ago, after the pilot accidentally switched off his autopilot system, just as it was in the middle of landing the plane in dense fog. The crew of two managed to get the plane back in the air, but its landing gear has been critically damaged. Now, they have to land it. They left behind most of their undercarriage at East Midlands, while they now diverted with their broken aeroplane to Birmingham. The right-hand landing gear has been ripped from the aircraft. They are going to have to land this 56-ton plane on one set of wheels. The two pilots, still coming to terms with one crash landing, are about to be put through a serious test of their ability and nerve. Emergency services are standing by at Birmingham International, and it's all being filmed by a West Midlands police helicopter. Well, you see the wing rising there. That's not a disaster about to happen. That's the pilot trying to keep it on the left gear for as long as possible so that when the right wing comes down and hits the tarmac, it won't be such a big impact and therefore less risk of uh, the engine being torn off. This landing has gone well, so far. But the pilots aren't out of danger yet. The engine is scraping along the tarmac, spitting red-hot sparks of metal just a few feet from their fuel tanks. If the tanks are ruptured, the results could be catastrophic. Firefighters spring into action, dousing the plane with fire-retardant foam. Until finally, all is safe. I would imagine that uh, Birmingham Airport is going to be closed for a while now. They've got this aircraft now stranded on the runway with uh, only two out of the three sets of wheels, so nothing else is going to be able to land or take off. While the two pilots were praised for landing the plane in such difficult circumstances, they were both fired for their role in the earlier accident. This is Leeds Bradford International Airport. 
At 681 feet above sea level, it is the highest airport in England, guaranteeing it more than its fair share of high winds. It's had more than a few dramatic landings in recent years. But it's not just the strength of the wind that's the problem here. It's the direction the wind is blowing that really matters. And around these parts, that's not always easy to predict. The runway never seems to line up with the local wind for some reason. And because it's on a hill, it can be quite blustery and challenging. It's not the longest runway in the world, and it does have quite a slope on it on one end. It certainly focuses the attention. The problem for pilots is that Leeds only has one runway, so there is no plan B if a crosswind is blowing. You either land or go elsewhere. But of all the jaw-dropping landings that have touched down at Leeds Bradford, one stands out above all others. On August the 2nd, 1986, this small regional airport showed the Prince of Planes that she was not to be taken lightly. 60,000 people stood out on a cold and windy day to greet the first ever Concorde flight from Charles de Gaulle in Paris to Leeds Bradford in Yeadon. Concorde was running late. Rumours spread throughout the crowd that it had been diverted to Manchester because of crosswinds. But then, with a boom, it appeared. Thirty-mile-an-hour winds meant the Concorde was right up against its crosswind safety limits. The captain appears unsure whether to touch down. Then, with a blast of his two Rolls-Royce engines, he roars off, landing a few minutes later to huge applause. The French captain told local journalists that his first approach was all part of his grand entrance. Not everyone was convinced. Safe, yes, but difficult. Would you like to try it again? Yes, yes, but not today, because we come back today to Charles de Gaulle as soon as possible. It was the first time Air France landed their Concorde at Leeds Bradford, and the last. From then on, the supersonic plane was flown into Leeds by British Airways. It's March the 1st, 2008. Once again, winds are the problem. Extra-tropical cyclone Emma is wreaking havoc throughout Central Europe. In Germany, gusts are reaching 60 miles an hour. Inside this flight from Munich to Hamburg, Passengers and crew are feeling the effects of some seriously strong crosswinds. The pilot has a decision to make. Abort the landing and go elsewhere, attempt to go around and try again, or take the landing on. The general point about crosswinds is that there is a limit. Every aircraft's got a crosswind limit, but the winds can be gusting. You could be, you might have a crosswind limit of 35 knots, which is a lot. Imagine sticking your head out of a, uh, of a car window going at 40 miles an hour. That would feel like a lot. Well, that's what's blowing against the plane, you know, in the wrong direction as the time that it's trying to land. The problem for this pilot is that it's notoriously difficult to predict when a gust will come and how strong it will be when it does. Either way, this pilot appears to be feeling confident. It might look like the plane is being blown all over the place, but this pilot is doing what is known as crabbing, a crucial skill in this kind of landing. I call it crabbing because you're moving effectively sideways into the wind, and it looks extraordinary. And then, at the last minute, which is why pilots love it so much, they kick the rudder, uh, kick the rudder. You know, I mean, how many opportunities do you get to kick the rudder on a commercial airliner? Brings it on straight, and on it goes. But before he kicks the rudder, a huge gust of wind hits the plane. 
It lurches to one side, and then, the worst case scenario, the wing hits the runway. That kind of impact can flip a plane right over, sending it cartwheeling down the runway. The aircraft quite clearly uh, wasn't stabilized on its approach uh, to that landing, and I think should have been thrown away at a much earlier stage. He should have made a go around much sooner, but he persisted, hoping it was going to come right, and clearly it didn't come right at all. It's a terrifying moment for all on board. With no options left, the pilot powers up his two engines to try and pull the plane back into the air. It works. The pilot regains control and climbs to safety, landing the plane shortly afterwards on another, less windy runway. Coming up on world's scariest plane landings, lightning over London. And we go inside the cabin of the most talked about landing of 2011. Welcome back. We're counting down the world's scariest plane landings. The pilot has just told you to buckle up. The crew are seated. You're just eight minutes from your destination. That is when your flight is at its most vulnerable. And we have the footage to prove it. It's November 2011. Flight LO016 from New York to Warsaw is in trouble. Just after departure, the computerized crewing alert system warned of a malfunction in the central hydraulics. Result? The landing gear is stuck inside the belly of the plane. The pilot has decided not to tell his passengers that they have a problem until he has a plan. There's usually a point in any incident, particularly this one, where there's a period of time for the flight crew to diagnose the situation and potentially be able to rectify it. So there wouldn't necessarily have been a need to brief the passengers at any point during the flight until it became apparent that there was going to have to be an emergency landing. The captain decided to push on for Warsaw, working on a solution with his team. They have tried everything but nothing has worked. A pilot is very rule-bound and rule-based and will follow all the protocols, all the standard operating procedures as far as he possibly can. But there comes a time when it doesn't matter what rules you have, you have to, you have to break those rules in order to achieve the, the aim, which of course is getting the airplane safely on the ground. The crew eventually had to accept the fact that they were going to have to land the aircraft with no landing gear whatsoever. With his fuel running low, the Polish pilot informs his 220 passengers that the plane's landing gear is stuck inside the plane. But he does have a plan. He is going to try to land this 150-ton plane on its belly. Ultimately, the thing that can damage the airplane and the passengers inside it is collision with something solid. And so in, a, in an aircraft crash, it's either another airplane or it's the ground. Fireproof foam has been sprayed on the runway. But as it scrapes along the tarmac surface, fires are breaking out along the bottom of the aircraft. The risk is that if uh, an engine or a wingtip digs into soft ground, that will cartwheel the airplane and, and the fuselage will break up and passengers will be injured or killed. Inside the plane, the drama is being filmed by one of the passengers. His fellow travelers desperately bracing themselves as the aircraft slides down the runway. Then finally, the Boeing 767 comes to a halt. Initially, passengers applaud in relief, but then, as they notice the black smoke seeping into the cabin, there is mass panic. It's a remarkable outcome. Despite a critical technical failure, not one of the 231 people on board was injured. The aircraft are complex, 
with complex parts and they will fail. However, when all of that does fail, you can be reassured that you still do have two human beings up the front who are well trained. Their job is to take care of themselves and take care of you. But there is one thing pilots can't control, the weather. There are over 16 million lightning storms across the world each year. With so much lightning, it's not surprising that on average, every passenger plane in Britain gets hit at least once a year. And when an aircraft is hit, it can be quite a shock for the pilot. The first time I encountered a lightning strike was as a, a, a very young first officer, and I was frightened. I was convinced the airplane was broken. This Airbus A380 is in its final descent into Heathrow Airport. There are 500 people on board. It's a miserable night. Suddenly, several hundred million volts of electricity blast straight into the roof of the cockpit. What happens next is truly shocking. Absolutely nothing. The plane carries on as normal, and it lands moments later with no ill effects. When they're struck by lightning, the conductivity is around the outside of the aircraft. It goes to the other end of the aircraft and, and leaves the aircraft, and there is just not a problem. So it can make a bit of a noise and a big flash. Um, sometimes the flash is quite blinding, but you know that it's not actually going to affect the aircraft. But it's, um, it can affect the passengers, because, of course, they, they will hear it and see it. But you just need to explain to them that there's no problem and the aircraft's fine. If our last clip was all down to Mother Nature, then this next one is 100% man-made. This plane is about to land at the tiny Caribbean airport of St. Bart's. The pilot must complete a special training course just to attempt landing here. The thing that struck me about St. Bart's was it's a really steep approach. Any airport that's tricky to get into, you know, it, it really does, as a commercial airline pilot, watching p other pilots land into these really tricky airfields, I just think it's amazing. I just really want to have a go. <laughs> the pilot has managed to navigate the almost vertical descent onto the runway, but he is not safe yet. St. Bart's has a notoriously short landing, and suddenly the beach is getting closer. And closer. Did they guys get a start? Whoa! <gasps> Crap! Thankfully, the pilot and his crew walked away without injury. His plane and his pride were a little more damaged. But this isn't the only unique landing in this part of the Caribbean. In fact, if you want to visit St. Bart's, you'll need to catch a connecting flight from its bigger next-door neighbour, St. Martin's. Every day, planes fly just a few feet over the heads of sunbathers relaxing on the beach. It's become quite a custom here to wait for the jumbos as they bring a fresh lot of sun worshippers straight to the island. This is Manchester International. And while this landing appears much more straightforward than the one we have just seen in St. Martins, it isn't. On the flight deck, the pilot is dealing with a major incident. Just moments ago, he had to shut down one of his two engines, turning a routine flight into a full-scale emergency landing. The cause? A bird. Flight 263H had just taken off. It was traveling at close to 160 miles an hour when this happened. The black shape on the right is a crow, heading straight into one of the plane's two 800,000 horsepower engines. As the bird is sucked in, flames start shooting out. 
It's a very critical phase of flight. It's not a point at which they can simply shut down the engines and land. There isn't sufficient runway available. So they, they are committed to flight. Passengers can see the damage, and the pilot needs to react quickly. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Thompson 253 Hotel, engine failure. We are continuing. At this stage, the pilot still can't be certain what has caused the fire. Unsure how badly his engine is damaged, he has no choice but to shut down one of his two engines. All the strain of lifting the 100-ton aircraft is now being taken up by just one engine. As the plane gains height, the pilot and the air traffic controllers are already making plans for a full-scale emergency landing. But the damaged plane is not the only problem. Debris from the impact of the bird strike has forced Manchester Airport to close down one of their two runways. Thompson 263 Hotel, runway 6 left is closed at Manchester due to debris on the runway from your engine. Okay, it looks like it may have been a bird strike, there's bird debris on the runway as well. I can go through what we saw out the window and uh, the reaction we had from the engine. Thompson 263 Hotel, roger. The captain and his crew are now drawing on hundreds of hours spent in aircraft simulators, preparing for a situation just like this one. If you're challenged by something that goes wrong, you want to make sure that you get the aircraft on the ground safely. And the fact that you're carrying the 300 people to safety um, is, is part of it, of course it is. But you have to focus exactly on the task that you've got at the time. So whatever challenge it is, you make sure you achieve that. The captain of flight 263H still has to get his plane and his 221 passengers down safely. On the ground, fire crews are standing by because a fully loaded 757 can carry up to 45,000 litres of highly flammable aviation fuel. The big risk with any emergency landing is always going to be the risk of fire. That's probably the biggest concern that anybody has in aviation, because once a fire breaches the aircraft cabin, there are typically no more than about two minutes before conditions in the cabin become non-survivable. But fire isn't the only problem facing this flight. With just one engine, the plane can pull to one side running the risk that it could literally turn the plane over. It might look like a straightforward landing, but this takes hundreds of hours of training. The crew on that plane were very experienced, very well trained. At no time did the crew get agitated or excited. They operated calmly, professionally, as did air traffic control. The pilot of this plane executed a perfect one-engine landing. But what happens if both engines are struck down? Coming up on the world's scariest plane landings, it's time to meet the man who makes miracles happen. Uh, thank you, Sergio. going to the Hudson. Flight 1549 was routine and unremarkable for the first 100 seconds and then it instantly became an ultimate challenge of a lifetime for all of us. Welcome back to World's Scariest Plane Landings. We've seen nine of the most extraordinary plane landings ever caught on camera. But there is one landing that stands above all others. This event is just a complete one-off. It's just so extraordinarily unusual uh, that it's hard to uh, imagine it being repeated. This is the Hudson River in New York City. In 208 seconds, security cameras will record an event so remarkable it will become known all over the globe as the miracle on the Hudson. On the 15th of January, 2009, U.S. Airways Flight 1549 departed LaGuardia Airport in New York City, bound for Seattle. There were 155 people on board. The 
plane was supposed to take off at 2.45. I don't think we took off until about 3.30, 3.30-ish. In the cockpit, 57-year-old Captain Chesley Sullenberger prepared his plane for takeoff. Flight 1549 was routine and unremarkable for the first 100 seconds. And then it instantly became an ultimate challenge of a lifetime for all of us. In 100 seconds, the Airbus A320 has traveled just four and a half miles and reached a height of just 2,818 feet. Then, disaster. A massive flock of geese flies straight into the path of Flight 1549. I see the birds ahead of us. I saw them about one and a half seconds before we hit them, about the length of one and a half American football fields, but clearly not enough time to avoid them. And then I feel the thumps and thuds as we strike this large flock of birds from side to side across the leading edges of both wings onto the nose of the airplane just below the level of the cockpit windows and into both engines. And I immediately hear and feel the, the noises and the terrible vibrations as the engines are being damaged by these birds. And then I feel intensely the, this, the forward momentum of the airplane nearly stop in midair. It feels as if the, the bottom is falling out of our world as we lose this thrust that's been powering us uphill. At least one eight-pound bird had been sucked straight into the core of each of the Airbus's two turbofan engines. Both engines were dead. The bird struck at 27 minutes past three. The plane climbed slowly for a further 19 seconds. Then, with 155 people on board, it started to drop out of the sky. The crew instantly found themselves in control of a glider. Gliders only go one way, and that's down. They had to find somewhere, the safest option, to put that aircraft down. You have to be able to respond calmly to an emergency. There's no point in throwing your hands up and saying, I can't cope, because that, that way lies a problem, clearly. All of this comes back to training and being the right sort of person not to effectively crack under pressure. Oh, the bird strike was shocking. I mean, uh, after almost 30 years of routine flying in the airlines, where we worked very hard never to be surprised by anything, this was instantly completely different. And I knew it as it was happening. I knew this was a life-changing event for everyone on the airplane and their families. Captain Sullenberger was now fighting for the lives of everybody on board. Every decision from this moment on was time critical. Less than 30 seconds after the bird strike, using the codename Cactus, Sully made contact with air traffic controllers at LaGuardia Airport. Uh, this is uh, Cactus 1539. Hit birds through lost thrust on both engines returning back towards LaGuardia. Okay, uh, you need to return to LaGuardia. Turn left heading of uh, 220. 220. Sorry, stop your departure. He's got emergency returning. Oh, it's 1529. He, uh, bird strike checked. It's 1529. Which engines? He lost thrust in both engines, he said. Got it. There are two airports below him, LaGuardia and Teterboro. But within seconds, Captain Sullenberger realizes he won't be able to make either of them. Cactus 1529. We can get it for you. Do you want to try to land 1313? We're unable. We may end up in the Hudson. It's 1529. Turn right 280. You can land runway right. 1 at Teterboro. We can't do it. Okay, which runway would you like at Teterboro? We're going to be in the Hudson. I'm sorry, say again, Cactus. 2-1-0-4718. It's the last time air traffic control speaks to Flight 1549. They know they can do no more. Captain Sullenberger is gone. What should the good pilot be doing at this point? He should stop talking to air traffic control. They're just distracting him. He does that. He does. He hits all the right buttons. He's doing his job really well. He's a seasoned professional. And it's almost like, you know, his whole career is le leading up to this. There were only two runways anywhere near us that we might conceivably even be able to attempt to reach. And I had to judge whether or not I would have the time and altitude. And I decided I just wasn't sure I could make it. I didn't think I could. So the only place left in the entire metropolitan area, one of the most densely populated areas on the planet, 
that was even possible to, uh, to attempt a landing on that was wide enough, smooth enough, long enough for an airliner to try to land on was the river. There was nowhere else to go. Then, flight 1549 began to appear on the various security cameras dotted along the Hudson River in New York City. Planes that land on water will often break up. So the thing that the thing that we're going through his mind is that if a wing tip digs into the water or if one of the engine pods digs into the water, then that can cartwheel the airplane and the airplane won't survive that, it'll break up. And that will kill a lot of the passengers. Then, 208 seconds after the initial bird strike, Captain Sullenberger, having glided his 70-ton aircraft down from 3,000 feet, touched down on the River Hudson at 160 miles an hour. I knew it would be a hard landing. I didn't know how hard. And so that's why I chose in my one announcement to the cabin to use the word impact. My priority at that point, when I said this is the captain brace for impact before the landing, was to prevent passenger injury during the landing itself. And I knew if I did that, then the people would be able to evacuate and be rescued. But there was another problem. The Hudson River in January is barely above freezing. If rescue services didn't act quickly, the remarkable landing would be in vain. Passenger Mary Ann Bruce remembers the scene. The back of the plane has water running in, cold water, freezing water. Again, I'm in 5D, so I'm going forward. Because we're at an incline, I'm going forward. I'm not experiencing any water, and I'm going to sit on the raft. So it's only when I get on the raft that I get some water because water's splashing from the river, and we're trying to grab people to put them in the raft to safety. I found out from people in the back of the plane that there was tons of water gushing in, and before they could even attempt to get to safety, cold, freezing water, in a lot of cases, was up to their neck. The first ferry arrived alongside us about three minutes, 55 seconds after we stopped. Uh, and by the time I left the airplane, there were ferries around us, and the rescue was well underway. were in need of help. And so many people reached out to us in so many ways. It felt as if all of New York and New Jersey were reaching out to embrace us, to warm us. And when they did, it was with blankets from the American Red Cross. Captain Sully, faced with the ultimate test of his piloting ability and sheer nerve, passed with flying colors. Every one of the 155 people on board was down safe. It's the scariest and greatest plane landing in modern history. Think I might go by boat next time. Now